Lord who created the heavens and the earth. Amen. We welcome everyone to church today as we gather to worship Christ. We want to pray for Joel this morning as he is preaching at the Kershaw EPC Church. And so we want to pray for him as this is a, another opportunity for him to preach God's word and his training to be a minister of the gospel. A uh, few announcements. We are collecting addresses for college students, um, for recent graduates. If you have any who are college students or recent graduates, please let us know. Call or email the church. Um, very important, Wednesday nights. If you're coming on Wednesday nights, you need to sign up. We're having different people cooking. So it's very important for us to have, uh, as, as close as we can, an accurate count. Mm, congregational retreats, Bon Clarkin. Um, the sooner you sign up, the better, the easier on our planning. But the deadline is September the 25th. Um, <clears throat> Discipleship Committee is going to meet Sunday after Sunday school on the September the 18th. Men's book st study starts this Thursday. We'll have a a meeting at 6.30 a.m. and one at 10 o'clock a.m. as well. There's still time to be a part of that if you would like. Um, please make a note of the other announcements that are in the bulletin. Uh, there's a lifeline announcement as well. There's also um, Facebook, um, email. We send out a whole lot of stuff. So pay attention to that stuff that comes out and you'll be in the know of what, what's going on. Well, with that in mind, let us now turn our hearts to worship God. What a pri what privilege it is to be in the house of the Lord, to be out of this crazy world, and to be in the presence of the God who rules and controls all things. So with that in mind, let us stand together and let us hear God as he calls us to worship today from Psalm 35. Let those who delight in my righteousness shout for joy and be glad and say evermore, Great is the Lord who delights in the welfare of his servants. Then my tongue shall tell, you, tell of your righteousness and of your praise all the day long. Amen. Let's turn now and sing praise to God as we've been called to worship. Let us worship and let us sing in our Red Trinity hymnal number 235, All Glory, Laud, and Honor. Let us pray. A 
But God, our Father, we come before you. And our hearts are moved to sing this, this hymn, All Glory, Laud, and Honor. And how true this is. For you are not like us. For you are outside of this creation. You are perfect in every single way, in all that you are, in all that you do. You are good. You are right. And it is appropriate for us to come and this morning sing all glory, laud, and honor to you, our one true and living God. Father, as we come before you and we see you for who you are, as we see you, as we experience you, as we see your goodness, as we read your word and your word reveals your character, Father, your word also reveals that we are not like you, that we are fallen, that we are sinful, and that we are in need of a Savior. So we come with confession, and we come confessing our sins before you, explaining who we are by nature, that we were born into this world in sin, and we are hopeless without Christ. And we come and we claim the promise of Christ, the promise of the gospel. And it's through that we come this day. Not because of our good works, not because we have chosen to believe, but because you have chosen us, that you have pulled us and you have made us your own. And it is by grace and mercy alone. This is how we live. And this is how we worship. And Father, as we gather together, as we begin our worship, we use the, word that, the words that Christ used in teaching us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. As we've come before the Lord and we've acknowledged who he is and as we've confessed our sins, it's good for us to stop for a moment and be reminded that we have an assurance of pardon from the word of God. And this morning we see that from Romans 8.11. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. If God has come and it dwelled in you, he has brought forgiveness. He has brought pardon. As we come and confess what we believe and whom we believe, we see that in the Apostles' Creed this week, um, it's very important for us not to just do this out of old hat. We can, the danger is to just wrote, you know, it's just wrote, right? All right, let's get through this, and then we're going to do this. Take a moment, focus, and as we say this, think about what you're saying. Christian, in whom do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, we come as a thankful people, do we not? I hope you do. So often I think we're so busy, we we focus on what we need from God, hopefully in your individual prayer life, in your family prayer life. Hopefully there's a sense of thanksgiving. When good things happen to you, we see that God is the giver of all good things, and we stop and we say, thank the Lord. Praise the Lord. And hopefully we don't just say praise the Lord as a kind of like the world says it, right? We say it as 
truly being thankful. We have much to be thankful for. God has provided not only financial means, but so much more. Um, this morning, we do take up tithes and offerings. We're not passing the plate, but we do have them on the side here. We have an app. You can drop them by. Y'all know how to do that. Um, and be diligent. If you want to show your thanksgivings, then one of the ways you do that is by doing what God has said. And he said to tithe and to give offerings and to be free, free and cheerful givers. With that in mind, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come and we are a thankful people because you have made us thankful. Because you have shown us that you are, that you are God who has given us all things. All good and perfect gifts come from you. That we survive by you. That though we have jobs and those jobs pay paychecks, yet we know you are the one who provides our skills. You have provided the opportunities and you have given us what we need. And so much more. So, Father, as you have first given to us, we come and we give back to you. And we do so not as a drudgery, not as a duty uh, in and of itself, but out of love and a cheerful heart. And we pray that you would help us to obey your word and to be good givers of our, of our time, of our money, of our talents. And, Father, we are thankful that others have done this before us. And we are thankful for the many blessings that you have given us in this life. And if we truly stopped and we started counting our blessings, how long would we be there? Would we never stop? For we see how great your mercy, how great your grace, how great your love for us, your children. Your word tells us if we as earthly fathers know how to give good gifts to, to our children, how much more do you as our heavenly father bless us and give us what we need and even more than what we need. So we come and we give thanks to you. We thank you for answered prayers. We thank you as we read the word, you open our eyes and open our hearts and open our minds. We thank you for Christian friends. We thank you for the church. We thank you that you've given us the church and it's not optional but it is the means by which you say Christ died for his church. And we are thankful we can be a part of the church and the fellowship of the church and the work of the church. Father, we come and we give praise to you for all that you are doing and all that you have done. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Take your blue ARP Psalter. We're going to sing Psalm number 78, Psalm 78, Selection B, which is, O Come, My People.
Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Oh God in heaven, we come and we pray that we would not be the people that we see here in Psalm 78. Father, help us to be true to that which has been passed down through the church, your word, and the theology that flows from your word. Help us not to be rebellious through and through. Father, may your spirit and word correct the hearts of your people. And may we stay true to you. Father, your word is like a two-edged sword. And we thank you that you have not left us in ignorance, that you've not left us in our sin, but that you've given us your word, and your word is powerful to correct us and to challenge us, to transform us and change us. Father, humble us that we might obey your word, that we might see it as a reflection of your very character, that we might see it as not something that has come down from man but has been inspired and comes from the very mouth of God help us to see it not like our laws and our rules things that might be bent and even occasionally broken but may we see it for what it truly is it is your word it is your law It is your love to us that we might know you, that we might know ourselves, that we might know the gospel, and that we might know what it is to be holy, that we might know what it is to be righteous. Father, work in our hearts. Father, work in our hearts and help us to hear your word and apply it. Father, we come on this weekend and we celebrate Labor Day. We pray, Father, thanking you that you have given us work. We thank you for those who labor, whether it be white collar in an office or blue collar in a factory or whatever it is, from digging ditches all the way to being a a CEO. Father, you have ordained work. It is a creation ordinance. It is before the fall. It is part of why you created man. You have given this as to be a joy and to be a help. And so, Father, as we take a day to rest from our labor, a special day to remember our labor, we pray, Father, for those who work. We pray that you would help us in our work. We pray that you would give work to those who are seeking. And, Father, we pray for those who are lazy, those who will not work. We pray, Father, that you would give them work. And, Father, for those who can't work, who are too old or disabled, and so many of them, Father, want to work, but can't. We pray you would give them peace and we pray that you would give them purpose. Father, you have not made us that we might sit and do nothing. You have called us to activity. You've called us to provide. You've called us to be productive. We pray, Father, you would help us to do that wherever you're calling us in whatever stage of life. Father, we come and we pray for our world. We pray, Father, continue to remember the war in Ukraine. We pray, Father, for other areas of our world where there is violence, there's unrest, there's tyranny. There's the danger of war. We think of Taiwan and China. We think of other areas where uh, just there is no law. Help us to be thankful for our government, for the laws that we have. Imperfect as it is, Father, it is a blessing. We pray for our nation. We pray for wisdom for our leaders for our state. Father, we come and we pray again yet another Sunday morning. We pray that you would end the violence that we see here in our community. Yet another shooting this week. And for a small town, it's just too much. And we pray that you would restrain this evil, but more importantly, you would change the hearts of the people here, that you would bring the gospel to bear. Father, help us to have faith to believe That if we pray for you to act by faith, you will act. And you will restrain evil. More importantly, you'll change hearts. Father, give us faith to believe and show us as we pray in belief, as we pray by faith, we pray that you would.
show us your hand at work through our prayers according to your will. Father, we come. We come and we pray for our schools. Father, our schools have been an area where we see such a battle. We see a battle of the mind, a battle of trying to teach young people to think. We see a battle of cultures, but we see also a battle of morality. We see a battle between truth and a a, a world that doesn't believe in truth. We pray for our Christian teachers. We pray you would protect them and lift them up. We pray, Father, for Christian children who are in school, that you would have your hand of protection upon them. And, Father, we pray that you would bless our public schools, that you would work through them, through different groups that are in there, Fellowship for Christian Athletes, others, Young Life, different groups that are there bringing the gospel. And, Father, we pray that the kingdom would come into these places and that you would work in the hearts of young people, that there would be salvation, that there would be growth, and there would be protection. Father, there's a great need, and we ask you to meet that need in our schools. We lift up those who are not in public school, in private school, home school, and Father, they're not out of danger either. For we live in a world that is after our youth, and they have so many tools to get there. Social media, television, movies, music. Father, protect our young people. Fill them with the Holy Spirit. Give them a love for your word. Build them strong in Christ so that when this world is too much, when they are pressured, when they feel hopeless, Father, give them the hope of Christ. Give them the rock of Christ. And keep them upon Christ and in Christ. For there they will be saved. Father, we come to our church. We pray that we would not, on one hand, just look at others and say, well, aren't we better than them? For that is the Pharisee. Father, kill that spirit upon us. But Father, also help us not to look just at ourselves. Father, help us to be humble in ourselves, but also help us to reach out into this community. Father, help us at First Lancaster, At First ARP, may we be a light of the gospel that's not just here when we preach, but is in every workplace, every home, every school where our members go. May the light of the gospel go with them. And may we be a city on a hill. And may you make us useful for your kingdom in sharing the gospel, in building disciples, in speaking for the truth of God. Father, we come and pray for the afflicted. We pray for those who are afflicted without faith. We pray for the lost. We pray, Father, that you would bring them to faith. We pray that you would, again, keep the saints. We pray, Father, that you would bless our church and its ministry. We pray for those who are sick, those who are injured, those who are recovering from surgery, those who are battling cancer. Father, you know all the physical, mental, uh, physical medical needs that we have. And we lift them up before you. And we pray for you to work. We pray that you would bless those who are dealing with mental illness. We pray for those who are dealing with just emotional issues, panic attacks, those who are struggling just to live in the world today and how we can see that, Lord. It is a struggle. And we pray you would, again, lift them up. Father, in all things, we come before you. And we pray that you would give us your spirit, that it would work in our hearts and minds and lead us by your word closer to you, that you would keep us safe in Christ, for there is our protection, that you would keep us with Christ in his church, and that we are safe there, that you would give us that hope, and that you would give us that reality, and you would give
give us that promise. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all are dismissed. Continuing our look of the Gospel of Matthew, uh, excuse me, Mark. I don't know why I said Matthew, but Mark. And we're changing over. We finished chapter 5. We're now in chapter 6. Chapter 6 is an interesting chapter. It starts off with a bang here. Jesus going home. We'll see what kind of homecoming Jesus will have. Um, Let's go back before the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you again for your word. And we pray now that you would bless the reading and preaching of your word, that it would be for our good, that it would challenge us, it would transform us, it would encourage us. Most of all, Father, we pray that it would help us to know that we know you, the real you, and that we're trusting in you. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Mark chapter 6, beginning with verse 1, let us hear God's word. He went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hand? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, Jose, and uh, I don't think it's Jose, I think that should be Joseph, anyway, whatever that is, Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to him, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his home household. And he could not do mighty works there except that he laid hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went, among them, and he went about among the villages teaching. The grass withers, the flowers fade. But the word of our Lord endures forever. Amen. There is a difference between knowing Christ and trusting Christ. It's a difference. A difference between knowing and trusting in Christ. You can know about Christ. You can know about Jesus. You can know the Bible. You can know the story. You can know the teaching that Jesus did through his ministry. You can know his works, his works of of great healing, of Raising even the dead. Of even going to the cross and raising himself from the grave. You can know all about that. His hometown knew him. He comes back to Nazareth. It's not there in the text, but it says his hometown, and we know that's Nazareth. And he comes back there to the place where he had spent his first 30 or so years. He had grown up there. The people knew him. So when he comes back into town, it's not like it's a stranger. It's not like it's somebody that they did not know or just sort of knew on the periphery. This was Jesus who was a carpenter, who was at the center of life there, that they knew. And now they also know that his teaching, he has taught in the synagogue. And they know of his great miracles that he had done. They've seen a few here but have heard of others. But at the end of the day, they missed him as Savior and Lord. They had no faith in Jesus. They had no trust in this Jesus that they knew. Our teaching this morning is there is a danger in knowing things about Jesus, but not knowing Jesus and trusting in him. So the first thing we see is that Jesus goes home. It's not a pleasure trip. This isn't like, hey, I need to go see my my family. I need to take a couple days off and go. We're going to go to Nazareth. No, this is part of his ministry that he's moving through. He's got his disciples with him. He's doing his continual work. We see that he's teaching in the synagogue. He was asked to teach. 
Now think about this. Here is Jesus come home. Here is the hometown boy Jesus who all of a sudden has this marvelous ministry and is just the buzz of the whole area. And now he comes and they're going to let him teach in the synagogue. So the people come in and there's sort of this, that's Jesus. We know Jesus. What, what is Jesus doing? This hometown boy. And we're not sure what he taught. It doesn't say what he taught on, but the reaction is very clear. It's hard to go home. Jesus will later say, a prophet has honor everywhere except his hometown or with his family or relatives. When I was in seminary, Dr. Frank Kick was our practical theology professor. His father was Marsilius Kick, was one of the uh, original editors, I believe, of the uh, Christianity Today. And, and Frank was a bit of a rebellious child growing up. And uh, he always said it's very hard for a pastor to go home sometimes. And I remember the first sermon I preached in front of my, I will always remember the first sermon I preached in front of my parents. You want to talk about a humbling thing. Here is someone who knows everything you've ever done, and now you're up there preaching and standing for God. It's a little humbling. Frank was a bit of a rounder growing up. He was pretty rebellious. He had run with a pretty rough crowd before the Lord called him to ministry. And his first church was 45 minutes from where he grew up. And he said he lived in terror for two and a half years that he was a pastor of that church, that all those people that he used to run around with were going to find out where he was pastoring and show up. Well, Jesus has showed up where everybody knows him. But you know, Jesus is showing up not as a rebellious child who's been saved and called. He's not like... Frank Kick, or maybe Franklin Graham, if you're familiar with his story. He's not a prodigal son. He's not a rebellious child. This Jesus grew up among all of these people. And one thing we have to remember is Jesus is growing up. He is sinless and perfect. He grew up among these people completely holy. Now, it was not revealed to them who he was, But at the same time, they should have noticed that there was something different about this Jesus. For not only was he just a good guy, even beyond that, he was, a, he was perfect. One of the great encouragements to me in my early ministry is when I went into the ministry, and right before I was ordained and right after I was ordained, many of my extended family came to me and they were like, Kyle, we've been saying you're going to be a preacher since you were a little kid. One of my favorite great aunts, Aunt Chubb, she, she's like, she had died by that point. Her daughter said, sent me a note saying, Mama always said, Kyle's going to be a preacher. That's an encouragement. It's an encouragement because, you know, there's doubts that you have as you take this call and to have people who know you confirm that call. What a great encouragement. Jesus doesn't get this, though, does he? Here are all these people who knew Jesus. Jesus had to be a good guy, right? He was perfect. He was holy. But he doesn't get any encouragement. Look at the reaction. The initial reaction is astonishment. Now, there's a couple of times you can be astonished like, wow, isn't this great astonishment? Not this kind of astonishment. This kind of astonishment is like, whoa, wow. Jesus, whoa, what's going on here? Note the question. They're astonished, and the reason we know they weren't astonished and impressed was the questions they asked. Note these questions. Where did this man get these things? I mean, this man, this Jesus who we know, we know where he grew up. We know where he lived. We know, we know he built that whatever for us. The carpenter. Where did this man, where did Jesus get these things? Where did he get this teaching? Where did he get these gifts? You know, this is not uncommon. Often when somebody local, a local person makes it big, 
you know, if somebody from Lancaster makes it big, we're all excited, right? There's a, everybody's completely excited that that person made it big, right? Well, a lot of us might be, but there's always those others who go, what? I don't think they're all that good. I remember, I remember him when he was a little thing. He wasn't much of anything. And there's almost like a bitterness. I think that's kind of the idea here. Where did this man, where did this guy who came from Nazareth, where did this guy who's one of us get these things? What is this wisdom given to him, they ask? Five questions. What is the second one is, what is this wisdom given to him? How is Jesus getting all this knowledge? Did he go to, rabbi, uh, did he go to school with the rabbis? No. Well, he must just be making all this. What is this about? He doesn't have any education. How does he know all this stuff? Third question. How are such mighty works done by his hands? You see, they acknowledged that he was doing great works. See, these are not pagans. They're not godless Gentiles. These are the people of God. They knew the Old Testament. They knew the stories of the power of God. But ultimately what they're doing here is when they hear Jesus speak and when they see Jesus work, they, like the Pharisees, are questioning where is this power coming from? There's only two answers. It's either from God or it's from the devil. They're not leaning towards God but Jesus here. After all this, after all this, it's Jesus we know. Think of the questions they ask now. So we go from the, the content to the questions of, this is the Jesus that grew up here, right? This is the carpenter? This is Mary's son. Some people want to make a big deal about it being Mary's son. If you read some commentaries, they'll say that this was an insult. Some commentaries believe, or some of the commentators think, that this was kind of a slight saying, you know, this is Mary's son, not Joseph's son, Mary's son as sort of a, an idea that maybe he was illegitimate. Some other ones don't, I don't know. But the point is, they're saying, this is the boy that grew up here. He was the carpenter. He's Mary's son. Here are his brothers. Here is his sisters. Who is he to come here and teach us? Who is he to do these things? We know him. Is this not the problem we have in the world and even in the church? We think we know Jesus. But yet most of what or much of what the world believes and even the church is what we call bumper sticker theology. People have verses and they'll take these verses, and there's nothing wrong. We need verses. You need to have certain verses. It's good to pray through verses. It's good to have some verses to, you know, do combat with the devil with. But your Christianity cannot be based on 25 verses that you like. Your Christianity has to be founded upon the full, whole, total revelation word of God. And too many people are standing on too little Scripture, too little knowledge. A lot of Christians are what I call John 3.16 Christians. John 3.16 is great, right? Do not regard, we, we, we love John 3.16. There's nothing wrong with John 3.16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. It is the promise of the gospel. But your Christianity needs to be more than just that. It needs to be deeper, and it needs to be stronger. We cannot just have shallow experiences with God. We can never just look at the promises. For God's word is full of promises. It's full of grace. It's full of mercy. It is also full of, thus saith the Lord, go and do. Or thus saith the Lord, go and do don't do. There's commands. There's hard challenges of scripture. 
the word of God is a light that shines into our life and it shows us that remaining sin and tells us to kill it and tells us how to kill it depending upon Christ. Too many is just God is love and God is love. But what we need to have is a full orbed understanding of who God is, of our salvation, of all that he commands by just focusing in on one aspect or another, on a few verses or another, we don't really grasp who Jesus totally is. So often we will say, but we know Jesus. But is it the real Jesus? Do you know the full Jesus, the true Jesus, as he's revealed in the word of God? Again, we see it in our world today. People believe that God never condemns. God doesn't hate. But if you read the Bible, you see in the Old Testament, he condemns the nations. He brings judgment upon them. Um, he, says to, he says that Jacob I have loved and Esau I have hated. We come to the reality that we may have constructed a Jesus of our own making from a few Bible verses, from a few good ideas, and a lot of pragmatism. And this is a danger that we must address and make sure is not in our lives. Because if you want to know Jesus, if you really want to know Jesus so that you might trust in Jesus, you need to know the whole Bible. That doesn't mean you have to know it before you get there, but you have to believe it and be working through it and not just be satisfied with a partial picture of who Jesus is. Because Jesus is the Word. John 1. He is the Word. This is The Bible is the Word of God, but it is a reflection of Christ. It's not just our Christian philosophy. It's not just our Christian good ideas about how to live. It reveals the very character of God. Think about that. It reveals who God is. So you can't pick and choose what parts of the Bible you want. Because ultimately what you're doing is picking and choosing the God you want. That's not how it works. You can't pick and choose what you want from the Bible because it comes from God. The danger is you can know about God. The world knows about God. But never really know Christ and never really trust Christ. This is what happens here. You saw the initial response, astonishment, all these questions which lead to the ultimate response to his hometown, to his ministry, to his word, to his miracles. They took offense at him. Let that sink in. Jesus goes back to where he knows these people. He has a relationship with these people. He grew up with these people. Now he comes and he preaches as he always has. He teaches with authority and power the word of God. He even does some healings here. He lays his hands and heals some sick. And what does all this come to? They look at him and say, we know you. Who are you? And they took offense at him. Instead of hearing his wisdom, instead of seeing his mighty works, Instead of seeing he was clearly from God, they took offense at Christ. Some, well, we see the same problem today. So often we look at the craziness of the world, and we are very quick to be judgmental even to the world. What about the church? I think a a great fear that I think I have as a pastor and many of our, our fellow pastors have is that we have many who have grown up in the church or are associated with the church and that you think you know Jesus. And your real knowing of Jesus is like what is what we see here with these people who knew Jesus from growing up with him. You know about him. You might even be a little bit more appreciative of him. But what you have built is the wrong Jesus. 
you can have a nice southern conservative Jesus. He would be wearing probably, you know, seersucker today, right? That's the last day you can wear it. And he would vote Republican, right? The southern conservative Jesus. And he'd be trying to maintain the status quo. He wouldn't be rocking the boat because we as southerners, we don't do that. Is that your Jesus? Or maybe, maybe you have a progressive, liberal Jesus. One that's a social justice warrior. Progressive. Kind to everyone, accepts everyone. See, the problem is, if we're not careful, instead of letting God's word reveal Jesus to us, and us digging through it, and studying it, and allowing it to penetrate and most importantly, allowing us to grow in our knowledge of who Jesus is. If we're not doing that, we, we turn Jesus into the Jesus we think he is, rather than the Jesus he is. You can't mix and match what you want. And because of this, people today, just like in this day, in his day, people, when you confront them, and you confront their wrong Jesus with the real Jesus, and they hear the wisdom of Jesus, they see the power of Jesus, they are offended at the real Jesus. We want our cultural Jesus, not the Jesus of the Scripture. Where does this come in at? It's when Jesus speaks into our lives. It's when his word challenges us. Some examples of that. Jesus is clear that sexual immorality is sin. And what do we as good Southern conservatives say? Yes, it is. And those homosexuals, they are wrong. But what about adultery? What about pornography? What about lust? It's not just about homosexuality. Sexual sin is very clear in the scripture. And God is very clear about the consequences of it, both temporally and eternally. Jesus tells you to love others. And so often what we want to do is love others like us. But Jesus is clear. You're to love your neighbor. You're to love your enemy. And that gets so much harder. Jesus tells us to put no other gods before him. Yet what do you allow to come between you and God? What causes you not to pray? I don't have time to pray. Okay. Write down what you do every hour of the day. How much TV do you watch? How much Facebook do you surf? How many mindless games do you play? And there's nothing wrong with watching TV. There's nothing wrong with surfing Facebook. There's nothing wrong with playing video games. But don't say you don't have time to pray. What causes you not to be at worship? What gets in the way of you coming together Sunday morning and Sunday evening to worship God? Here's the danger. Again, that you can think you know Jesus. So that just like these folks, you take offense when the real Jesus shows up and says, here's what I want you to do. Here's what you need to do. Here's who God is, and it's not the God of your thinking. It's not the God who's a, just sort of saying, oh, that's okay, you can go do this. It's a God who's making demands on your life because he can, because he's King Jesus. When his word convicts you, when you are challenged, are you going to be offended? Or are you going to receive this? You see, this has consequences. This whole thing that happens here in Nazareth has huge consequences. Jesus acknowledged as a prophet in his hometown has no honor. He has no honor among his family, his relatives. Because they refused to believe in him. You know, Jesus isn't looking for a pat on the back. He's not saying, they're not wanting, way to go, Jesus. He's wanting them to believe. 
He marvels at their unbelief. And you wrestle with that. You know, here's the people he knows. These are the people who should be the, the first to accept. But yet they don't believe. Now in the last two things we saw in Mark 5, what do we see? We see a ruler of the synagogue, a, a respectable man, but a desperate man. And he comes and cries out to Jesus to heal his daughter. And why did Jesus heal his daughter? Because he believed. He believed Jesus was who he said he was and he had the power to do it. And by faith, the girl was, was healed. And on the way to healing that girl, the woman comes up and by faith said, I don't even have to bother him. If I can just touch his robe, if I can just touch his garment, I believe I can be saved from this horrible disease. And she is. We see these illustrations of faith and then we come and we see this giant example of unbelief from people who Jesus wasn't a stranger. It says here he could not do great works. And it wasn't that he didn't have the power, one commentator said, it would have been morally and spiritually incongruent. Another one said where the kingdom is rejected, it is un inappropriate for the king to share its life and joy. God isn't going to bring his blessing and his power to a place where they don't believe in him. It would be wasted. And again, Jesus marvels. How do they not believe? How do they reject? This is part of the suffering of Jesus, right? Could you imagine being a pastor and you go home and everybody laughs at you and is like, what are you doing? You're a pastor? Ah! Jesus rejected by his hometown, by his family, by his friends, by his relatives. And this is only the beginning of what we know Jesus would, under, would undergo. He was going to be rejected not just by his town and by his family, but eventually the world would reject him. And he goes to the cross alone. And there he dies for you and I. And that's part of his suffering and part of his passion. Christians, are you trusting in Jesus? That sounds awful trite, and it sounds awful Sunday schoolish, doesn't it? Oh, we need to trust in Jesus. Yeah, but what does it mean? Do we have faith? Do we as a church have faith that God can answer our prayers? When we prayed earlier, and we asked God to work, do you believe? Do you believe like the man who was desperate to have his daughter healed? Do you believe like the woman who was desperate to be healed from this 12-year disease? Do we believe that God can stop the gun violence? Do you believe God hears your prayer? Do you, God, do you believe God works? Or do you think we're just sort of throwing a Hail Mary up there? God works where there's belief. And this is not name it, claim it. This is not one of those, hey, if you just have enough faith, you know, Miss Mott's going to get a Lamborghini and Mike's going to get a sailboat. That's not how that works. What we're saying here is we believe God will do what God said he will do. He will save the lost. He will heal the sick. He will grow his church. He will bring his kingdom. That's why we pray, thy kingdom come. What do you believe when you pray that? Do we see the kingdom coming among us? Do we see God working among us? Do we see our prayers answered? I think on one degree we do. We see people healed. We've seen people come to Christ. My issue is I don't think we see it enough. Why is that? Is it because we don't have enough faith? Because we don't pray? Because we don't believe? It's something for us to chew on, isn't it? Where do we see faith work? What does it mean to trust? Just a couple areas. First, if you have faith in Jesus, if you're trusting in Jesus, 
then your prayer life will, re- will, will show that. Because when you trust him and you know this is your hope, this is your place of power, this is your source of strength, you're not going to ignore that. You're going to make it a priority. And God is going to meet with you in prayer. And you're going to learn to pour out your heart to him. And he's going to work as you pray by faith. You also want to read the word that you might know God and know his will, know him through his whole word and follow it. But ultimately what I think faith does is it fills us in a commitment that we just don't do it halfway, do we? There's certain things that we make commitments on, and we know that we can't make 100% commitments. We, you might be in Rotary, or you might be helping with uh, coach a team, a, a children's team, or you might be in the choir, or you might be doing something. You, can, you know you can't make 100% commitments. We're human on that, right? We can't spread, you know, we've got too much going on. But some things have to be, we have to be committed as much as we can to. One of those things is Jesus. If we are trusting in Jesus, you'll see it in your prayer life. You'll see it in your reading of the word. You'll see it in your commitment. And you'll see it in your heart's attitude. Jesus will not be an offense to you. His word will not be an offense to you. The the coming to church on Sunday will not be an offense to you. Following the word of God, while it may be hard, while it may be difficult, while it may be challenging, will not be an offense to you. Because you know who he is and you are trusting in him by faith. And that's the difference. It's one thing to know, it's one thing to know Jesus. It's another thing to trust him. It's another thing to have faith in him. Let us examine our lives and make sure that we know him from his word and that we're trusting in faith in his power, in his goodness, in his salvation, and in his wisdom. Let's pray. Father, we come this morning and we thank you that you have called us to be yours. And first off, I pray that you would help each of us to do an evaluation now and through the rest of this day and week to make sure that we know you for who you are. Help us to make sure that we're not just assuming who you are, that we're not just taking, uh, that we have a certain percentage of it and figure we're okay. Father, give us a hunger. Give your people a hunger to know more and more of who you are and what you have revealed about your character and all the things that are given in your word. And Father, may this faith drive us to greater prayer, to diving into your word, not just to know verses, but to know the great themes of Scripture. May it be a personal commitment, a family commitment, and a commitment to the church and to the living everywhere we go for Christ. Father, open our eyes. If we simply know Christ, help us to see where we are offended at Christ's lordship where we as children balk at the commands of the Lord open our hearts and drive us to repentance and give us full trust in you draw us to Christ that we might know him and that by faith we might be blessed in him for we ask it in Jesus name amen You take your red Trinity hymnals, we're going to sing Shout for the Blessed Jesus Reigns 369. Let's sing.
this morning Christ has been revealed to you through the word. That he is the savior of sinners. He is the son of God. He has come to be your savior. Believe in him and be saved. Now I receive the benediction of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Thank you.